a reading from our intro from this morning. Psalm 122. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her, that you might nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord, when our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. For my brothers and companions sake, I will say, peace be within you. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the rock of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies, protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust, leave me not, O Lord my God. reading from our chief hymn this evening. Oh, yes, excuse me, 756. Paul Gerhardt wrote this hymn in particular after burying many during a plague. And when he wrote these words, understand that he was burying multiple people in a day over and against a plague. When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. God, my loving, save your sins then. He who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. God gives me my days of gladness and I will, and I, and I will trust him still when he sends me sadness. God is good, his life attends me, day by day, come what may, guides me and defends me. From God's joy, nothing can nothing sever, for I am his dear lamb, he my shepherd ever. I am his because he gave me, his own blood for my good, by his death he saved me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice, O Jerusalem, for the Savior draws near. I've preached before about the different types of Advents. The Advent that leads to Christmas, the Advent every Sunday as He comes to us in body and blood, and of course, the second advent, when he comes to judge the living and the dead. We seem to be tarrying somewhere between the advent when he comes on Christmas and the advent when he comes to judge the living and the dead. And while we tarry, we have the meat of all meats and the drink of all drinks. His body for us, his blood for us 
and sins not against us. That, in and of a nutshell, is theology. We discuss what happens within those parameters, and of course, the Old Testament as well, though it's included in Rejoice, O Jerusalem, in this Latari Sunday. However, theology is not theology unless it is practical. Theology is not theology unless you can actually eat it and actually drink it and actually be washed by Christ. And so when I read these words from Paul Gerhardt, as I do all Paul Gerhardt's hymns, for he is the greatest hymn writer to ever pick up the pen, I can't help but have a tear be brought to my eye. And for one thing, I know the history of Paul Gerhardt and what he was going through, as I told you, the little snippet that I told you when he was writing this hymn. But also, I'm crushed by the words because are they not true? I mean, is it not true for us? And I don't mean just a bad day alone. I certainly am not saying that you cannot bring your bad day to God. I hope that you would. But what happens when you are completely destroyed in life? What happens when you get sucker punched by the devil and you're laying on the canvas thinking, where were you on that one, God? I could have used you in my corner. What about chronic problems, pains of body and of soul and of mind, these things that we may put a happy face on, but in reality, we just want it to stop. What about the days that God allows so much sadness that we can't even begin to fathom how a good God would allow such a thing. Perhaps that's not something that a pastor should say. But I personally believe that if I did not say it, I would be doing a disservice. Those days have passed, those days are present, and those days will come. After all, your worst day is yet to come. When that illness that places you in the hospital for the final time. Again, I would be doing you a disservice if I were to tell you that I as your pastor have not had those days. I have been flattened. I have been destroyed. I have crosses and trials that grieve me to such pain that I barely can get out of bed in the morning. And what do we say regarding these things? Is it not true for you as well? I believe that it is. And here's the reality of it. When we look back at what has flattened us, if we look back to see the sadness that God has allowed in, in our lives, what do we say? What can we say for ourselves when we're destroyed? By my fault, by my own fault, 
by my own most grievous fault. And does that make you feel any better? No. All you're doing is getting to the root of the problem, which hurts worse. But we must say it. Because if we do not say it, then we do not recognize our sin and therefore we cannot repent. If we cannot repent, we cannot be forgiven. If we cannot be forgiven, we cannot enter into eternal life. After all, Christ says, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. There's nothing that I have to offer the Lord that He does not supply through me. I do not pray unless the Holy Spirit prays through me. I do not sing unless the Holy Spirit sings through me. I do not repent lest the Holy Spirit repent for my most grievous sins and brings back to me the absolution. So here we have this stanza. When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. Notice that in particular could be a pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of verse. Excuse me, stanza. But it's not. This is not Joel Osteen's church. When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. Why? God, my, lo my loving Savior, sends them. He knows, for, he, he, he who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. And then this third stanza, which always gets me. God gives me days, he gives me my days of gladness. And I will trust him still, listen to this part, when he sends me sadness. It is the true test of a Christian, not when the days are sunny, but when the day is overcast. The test of a Christian is not when you can spring out of bed and onto your feet and meet the day with folders in your cup. It's for the days where you can't turn on the lamp because you can't stand to see any light at all. It's for the days that we remember the great sins that we've done. When we recall those family members who may not take our calls, for those family members who are lost to us in death, for those of us who know what it means to be in the darkest of holes and unable to articulate it. God sends days of sadness. This is the truth. He also tempers us in fire. As iron sharpens iron, we Christians sharpen each other. This cannot be done lest it be violent. There's just no other way. Iron cannot be sharpened unless it is violent. I've never seen a blacksmith use kind words to fashion a sword. When we are refined in fire, it is violent. Fire, heating up metal that it may be manipulate, manipulated. Or what about this one? Baptism is not a baptism unless it is violent. 
Baptism is a violent affair because it is at the font that good versus evil battle. It is there that the child is exercised. It is there that Christ is victorious over the devil. And if you think that Christ is victorious over the devil with kind words, he's not. He's victorious over the devil with his word. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit means that you have been marked to suffer in a world that hates you already. So gir gird your loins, dear Christians. It's going to hurt. Life is going to hurt. But God sends us gladness. He also sends us sadness. But God is good. His love attends me. Day by day, come what may, He guides me and defends me. There is nothing in this world that can separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus. That is a reality only a Christian can know. From God's joy can nothing sever. For I am his dear lamb, he my shepherd ever. I am his, why? Because he gave me his own blood for my good by his death to save me. If you do not believe that the sacrament of the altar is a violent affair, remember that the body and blood of Jesus Christ is the merit from the cross. The most violent act in the history of the world, in the history of the world. And imagine, He feeds us on it. We receive it, and we are forgiven by it. So regardless of what happens in our lives, and of course that's easy to say, in fact, I'll add a caveat. When we are knocked to the cat canvas and we look to the corner to see no God there to, to be with us, and we wonder, where are you, God? The reality is he's not in our corner because he is in our heart. Baptized into his most holy church. He's in our heart. In the worst days, in the best days, in the days when you can't get out of bed, the days when you bury a loved one, and your last day. In other words, now in Christ, death cannot slay me. Though it might, day at night, trouble and dismay me. This next part of the stanza is one that I have put in many sermons because I love the idea of my death being a portal. portal. Christ has made my death a portal from the strife of this life to his joy immortal. So when we come to that worst day of our lives, the last time we are admitted into the hospital, the day that we are to die, let us remember this. Our death becomes a portal unto the Lord. And from the strife of this life, we know that our Lord has been there from baptism to the grave to the second coming. And in between, we are fed with his body and his blood. Therefore, dear Christian, 
Hear this and know this for certain. For in this life, we shall enter into His joy, immortal. And with Him, we shall live for life everlasting. So I say this to you. When those days come, I'm not telling you to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm not saying to you to turn on Joel Olstein. In fact, I would say that when those days come, you simply can say these words as Christians. Lord Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. Save me. Lord Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. Save me. And he will. And he has. And he shall again. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.